All right, so we're back here at the ranch with another episode with Joe from Bruiser Industries. Again, thank you to Big Tech's Ordnance for making this happen. They were the ones who brought Joe out for the class, uh, and they've also made the range available for us to film more of these episodes for you. So one of the questions that I, you and I both get a lot is about rifle setups. You know, people ask, how do you set this gun up or that gun? And in a conversation you and I had offline, we were discussing this, and I said, you know, I think it would be beneficial for civilians to stop using maybe some of the verbiage or terminology that we see the military use and trying to mimic what they're doing and focus more on maybe doing a red dot gun versus a scope carbine gun and the differences in, in that you set those two up because I think the two biggest factors in how we set up our rifles are the optics, right? We, we know what they're capable of, um, barrel lengths vary, you can, you can do things at long range with short barrels, you can do things in close quarters with long barrels. So um, I think the biggest factor is more the optics and, and how those vary. So I want to get your thoughts on that and then uh, walk us through uh, a few setups and maybe some recommendations you have. I get asked this question all the time, which is, you know, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm 25 years old, I'm 23, I just left college, I'm trying to get into shooting. There's so many options out there, where the hell do I begin? And I use this a lot online, which is trying to develop your own why, which is basically your list of what you're gonna use the gun for. Mm -hmm. And I said this on, on a podcast I just recently did, is I try to answer when I, I ask people a bunch of, que bunch of questions, I'm trying to answer the 80% solution. What I mean by that is like, I wanna take off, because everybody's gonna what if everything. Like, hey, if I can only have one rifle and this is it, but what if I have to engage a moving buffalo at 987 yards? Or what, do I, what if I have to come in and do a hostage shot at three yards? It's like, okay, well, what, what is the 80% use? Because like you can what if both sides, and we were just having this discussion on, and we can what if both calibers. Like, yes, the terminal ballistics of 55 grain versus a 50 cal mm -hmm. is a little different. And that's a, it's a huge... <laughs> diversity or a spectrum but the thing is that's honestly what it comes down to people go like well 400 yards or 500 yards what should i use should i get a should i build a 12 5 6 5 creed more or should i build a 16 inch 5 5 6 i'm like let's slow down and answer the 80 percent all these these terms spr dmr sniper recce whatever is all based off of military contracts mm -hmm. and so the military establishes through after action reports that, hey, we are we are missing a capability. Whether that is, hey, we've got an NSW, we have a 10.5 and a 14.5, and then the next gun we have is a 13.5 or a 16 inch 7.62 gun, which isn't really a DMR and it has an L can on it. And then our first sniper rifle is a 20 inch 308. So we're missing this recce type build where we still wanna use magazine compatibility of 5.56 because that's what the other guys are running. But we wanna have this extended capability and so they the nsw goes hey we're putting out a bid to the industry for a recce build and this recce build has to meet these sets of requirements mm -hmm. so we're looking for between a 14.5 and a 17 inch barrel we're looking for ammo to be this caliber and we're looking for it to have this type of scope on it and those companies go out to bid that recce contract mm -hmm. third mardiv needs to replace their m16s and they want to get a 20 inch or an 18 inch free float with a low power variable optic for their uh, you know, level one sniper guys, they're gonna put out a DMR contract. All these terms come from the contracts and how they bid. Like the Mark 13, the Mark 20, the, these are all specific contracts, the ASR, the advanced sniper rifle. It's a, just a contract term. So you're not building a clone, you're building a clone of a contract. And that contract is then set by requirements based off of actor action reports. And so, Everybody's trying to delineate their build. Like, hey, I wanna build an SPR. What is an SPR? Well, if you wanna go back and look at the contract, what the SPR contract was, you'll have your list. Stop mimicking the contract requirements because you don't have the same after action or requirements or suite of guns that you're trying to fill a niche in as whatever unit based that contract or started that contract. And so the Filling the DMR role, the SPR role, the, the all these terms are all the same damn gun in the end, depending on what your varied use application is. And so that's the whole thing is like, what, what's an SPR? What's a DMR? What's a recce gun? They're all the same damn gun. It's just different units fill different contracts with slightly different yeah. requirements based mm -hmm. off of what they had. Then walk us through what, what we have here and then how you would recommend uh, the average person at home set up their rifles, considerations they should make uh, things to to take into account as they're setting up for that 80% you mentioned. We have three different guns here. We have a red dot and a magnifier gun. We have kind of a run and gun type use. Um, and we have more of like a DMR, SPR, 
whatever terminology you want to use uh, rifle here. It comes down to type of shooting you're going to do, the distance you're going to do it at, and then weight becomes a consideration. And so the, there's always a trade-off and we actually don't have a uh, larger scope. We have two LPBOs here, but you gain magnification, but you gain weight. You lose magnification and you also gain, uh, it becomes more complicated the higher you get versus like a red dot, super easy to mount. Mm -hmm. And so if you are going to something like, if we're starting at simple red dot, you take off the magnifier, remove that from your mind, uh, red dot gun. What, what can a red dot gun give you? If you're a 200 and in shooter, 300 and in shooter on big targets, and you spend most of your time doing close up carving courses, you live in an urban environment, um, most patrol cops, I mean, the, the idea that you're gonna take you know, 200, 300, 400 yard shots as a law enforcement officer is actually seriously flawed. Um, and this is after conversations with guys like uh, Chris Palmer at 532 Insight and a lot of, a lot of guys who have that background. Um, the argument can be made for PID. You can get PID by adding a magnifier. Uh, significantly more simple, you know, red Loctite, put some screws on, make sure it's torqued properly, index uh, or paint marker your mounting points. Like there's not a whole lot to screw up on this. There's no scope levels, there's no nothing. And so it's a, uh, if you're a close up kind of fast type shooter, I mean, this is probably the simplest setup you're gonna get. Mm -hmm. Barrel length wise, um, the argument can always be made, you know, shorter barrel, you lose something. Obviously now in the civilian side of things with the whole pistol brace rule, everything's in SBR now. Those are those consider considerations have to be made if you want something to be registered with the NFA, mm -hmm. and then you go shorter than 13.9 or 14.5 with pinned and welded. Yeah. Um, but. If you if that really is something that you don't feel like you can do CQB with a 16 inch gun, mm -hmm. go take a class because you don't know what you're doing. Because there's lots of Marines who have done lots of clearances and pushes to Fallujah with 20 inch <laughs> M16s. I'm not saying you necessarily need to buy a 20 inch M16, but yeah. I'm just saying that there's uh, more things to worry about necessarily than the fact that you have to have an eight inch SIG Rattler to do CQB. Sure. So um, that's I I basically tend to tell people that about 400 yards is kind of my line of, line of demarcation between for most 556 guns where the holds become greater than you can probably like see naturally with the human eye or quickly mm -hmm. and so then something like a reticle kind of starts coming into play yeah and so if you're if you're a 300 in shooter dude I, I tell people mag, mag red dot and magnifier all day magnifier again uh starts adding some complexity people think they can just mount magnifiers and call it a day magnifiers still have an eye relief mm -hmm and they have an ocular focus, yep. and you have to collimate the magnifier to the red dot. Mm -hmm. And so you always want to zero the red dot, make sure that's good, then flip the magnifier up, and then you're gonna shoot, and a lot of people are gonna have shift. Mm -hmm. And that's what the adjustment screws on the magnifier are for, is to collimate between the magnifier and the red dot. Yeah. But still simpler, and you have, as long as you witness mark all your screws, witness mark the adjust the eye relief mm -hmm. you should be good to go and most mounts are really repeatable the scalability is a thing you can then pull the magnifier off reduce the weight you can't pull half an lpdo off yeah and so you, you can remove it in a pocket, throw in a bag yeah as long as you have a witness card, mark yeah. put it back in the same spot most of them are on lever mounts mm -hmm. put it back on you're good to go so basically 400 and in then we start getting into scope carbines and so i get asked this question a lot which is 45 versus 12 o'clock red dot, as like we have on this one. Um, there's considerations to be made on both. You'll see most three gun shooters tend to have them at 45. It puts the optics at the same optic height, mm -hmm. so you don't have to adjust cheek weld. Um, so a lot of guys like this. The thing I don't like personally, it's really hard. You can't do anything with uh, night vision. Mm -hmm. Also, if you're shooting a lot of stuff like barricades and stuff, you're gonna run that thing right up into the barricade. Mm -hmm. And so I tend to put stuff at 12 o'clock, which then allows you to shoot passively with night vision. It keeps the side of your gun really clean. But if you're a up close and personal type shooter and you wanna do more of that, that canted style shooting, mm -hmm. um, it also can be used to limit exposure over the top of barricades, canting the gun, keeping your profile shorter, as opposed to exposing height over bore a lot more of the gun mm -hmm. to clear the barricade. Um, and you then have to adjust your cheek weld. Yeah. So that becomes a thing. Now, over this, you've now added significantly more weight, more screws you have to witness mark and, and keep track of. You still have an ocular focus, but now you have another optic to keep. Two zero, you have to worry about zeros. Are they the same? Are they different? What's mm -hmm. the trajectory? Levels. Is scope levels? Um, all those things come into play. 
having a scope level, this one doesn't have one, um, is super important on anything that's magnified on a with a reticle, mm -hmm. especially at distance. One degree of cant can cause 10 inches of deviation at a thousand yards. So that becomes a really significant thing. Like if you start canting the gun, even one or two degrees, uh, that's going to cause deviation in your impact even at 500 or 600 yards that are you going to blame it on wind is it going to be you is it shooter is it mm -hmm. positional so that becomes really important we have a regular non -adjust or adjustable buttstock here no additional things light bipod uh pretty simple running gun type yep. setup and we move up from there to more of a dmr and so again the sacrifices then become stuff like weight and everything else so we added this actually very similar setup, a one to 10 to a one to eight acro and acro. This one's at 12 o'clock, but we start to add, you know, uh, things that can help us in a more precision type environment. Mm -hmm. So this one's got arca rail on it. It's got a bad rider and a, and a little bit more uh, upgraded buttstock. So this one has a scope level on it. So you just start adding weight, you start adding size. If this was a four to 16 mm -hmm. or a four to 20, you start adding more weight with less low level uh, magnification capability. It really depends. And then obviously the barrel length argument. If yeah. this was a 14.5 pin and weld, and this was a 16 and this was an 18.5, you gain velocity as you get bigger too. Mm -hmm. So long way to say, where, where does each person fit? It really depends. If you are more of a long range type shooter mm -hmm. and you're gonna be spending the, the day on ranges like this, where we are right now, with a thousand yards to play with, and you're trying to make the most of it while still being able to do some run and gun, like mm -hmm. the other 20%, like I said, is then maybe something like this is more of your setup. Yeah. Whereas if you're kind of a 500 and in shooter, you're doing a lot of 50-50 um, kind of playing at long range, summit close, then maybe something like this becomes your your deal. Sure. And then if you're a 90% close up carbine shooter, you dabble at you know, 200, 300 max, that's what your local range has. Mm -hmm. You live in an apartment in Houston, then maybe a red dot and magnifier. Yeah. Then becomes more well, of your and, and I think the other thing too, uh, one thing that you mentioned about the, the range capability and having a place where you can practice, um, I think that comes into play as well because people often will say, oh, I, I'm gonna get this length or this optic just in case. And I always try to tell people like the skill doesn't show up on the day of the test. Oh yeah. Right? Like it's not just because you have an optic capable of it and you never practice it doesn't mean it's just going to magically appear. And so I think for most people, they should probably, if they don't, if they can't practice it, stick with the red dot. hundred percent. Um, cause otherwise you're buying skill that you don't have, or you're trying to buy skill that you don't have and you're well, not the, working it. The thing I start to see is that red dot ends up being very doctrinal in, in how people portray it. So you go to Joe Schmuckatelli's tactical, you know, ninja school, and he says, I run my my stock all the way out all the time. That's how it works for me. I set my red dot this far from the front of the receiver because that's where it is, mm -hmm. you know, whatever. All of these things are actually based off of how you are built. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to set my gun up the same way as oh, yeah. you. We know this. <laughs> so Notice my, my stock is all the way in. <laughs> my length of pull is going to be different than yeah. yours. The placement of the optics on the gun is going to be different. Mm -hmm. What I find comfortable, like people ask me about optic heights. Mm -hmm. Should I get a 1.5, a 1.7, a 193? You ran a 193. And then as you started shooting more precision, mm -hmm. guess what the, you do with that optic? Yep. Dun, 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 dun. Yep. And so it's, it's really personal preference. And the thing is, is that people don't want preference. They want to be given the answer mm -hmm. because it removes the personal responsibility of making their own decision. Yeah. And so it's a hard thing, right? It's a hard thing to make your own choice. Um, <laughs> and so it comes down to you have to identify what your reasons for application mm -hmm. are, what you're trying to accomplish, and then pull up your big boy pants, pull out the credit card, and make your own decision. Yeah. Instead of just having like, hey, okay, Jimmy, tell me exactly how you set up your rifle because, I mean, that's great, and yeah. this is a good setup. But well, I, I think people are afraid of making the wrong decision, right? Because it, it is expensive. Yeah. Um, you know, there, there is a lot associated with it. And so for people, it's saving time and money. They don't want to make the wrong decision, spend money, and waste money. Um, but we've all done it, right? I think it's, it's part of the learning process. The more people you listen to then, I think the more use cases and application you can then pull yeah. and then create that lens in which you can then make a more informed decision, not choosing somebody else's decision, yeah. using their lessons learned, yours, Taylor's, mm -hmm. you know, whoever's, and go, hey, they- De Developing your own why, like yes. you were talking about earlier. Yeah. Be and so the, the ownership, when you purchase something, then becomes, then whether you want it to or not, 
goes back on you mm -hmm. to then figure out if you spent your money wisely yeah. and train to the point you understand it. Mm -hmm. And so you, when you've spent the money, you, you can't pass that buck. You yeah. spent it. And so whether you use somebody else's why for the wrong reasons, that's on you at that point. Yeah. And so that's why it's really important to listen to as many people as possible, figure out all that their lessons learned mm -hmm. and see if that's something that will affect you or won't affect you. Uh, we've had the discussion on multiple different aspects of yeah. where the light goes, where the bipod goes, what type of bipod. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know it's an expensive decision to buy a $200 bipod or $800 bipod or a $3,000 optic or a $1,000 optic or, or rifle choice, barrel yeah. choice, suppressor choice. These are all expensive choices. Mm -hmm. at, and at the end of the day though, whether you buy what I tell you to buy or you tell the piece somebody to buy, that's why I always answer questions with questions because there's more than one way to do any of this. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's use case specific. As, as much as any, you know, influence on, influencer on Instagram or YouTube gets paid, you know, thousands of dollars a month to go, this is the only way you could possibly do it. <laughs> um, it's just not the case. Yeah. And there's good ways, there's good optics, there's good solutions, mm -hmm. good scope mounts, triggers, bolt carrier groups, doesn't matter. Every single one of them, there's lots of ways to skin that cap. Yep. And in the end, it's on you to be an informed consumer, to use your money wisely and uh, and determine your why. And if your why is, hey, I really want to build the exact gun that Gordon used in Black Hawk Down, mm -hmm. dude, more power to you. Go shoot your face off. Like, go And there's go nothing train. wrong with that. I Absolutely mean, not. Just don't, don't try to mask it. Like, just own it. Like, hey, yeah, that's why I made it. It's because I thought it was cool. I want the exact, yeah. you know, 6R that damn neck runs, or I want to buy the 12.5 that, you know, Noveski that, damn neck runs or I want to build a Mark 12 mod zero. Awesome, man. Yeah. Go shoot it. Yeah. That you, we, we live in one of the only free countries on the planet that you can make those decisions. Mm -hmm. And so more power to you. Yeah. That's, but that's your why. Mm -hmm. Don't try to sell it that nobody else needs anything but what you purchased. Mm -hmm. um, just own it and then enjoy the sport that we have to enjoy. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, one thing you did mention earlier that I wanted to touch on, uh, one of the questions you get a lot about is lights on uh, more DMR style rifles. Oh yeah. So uh, people ask me anymore, how do I feel about lights on longer precision type SPRs? This opinion has changed as lights have progressed. And basically the old Surefire Scout lights of four years ago yeah. did not give you the throw. Mm -hmm. And so basically what you do is the light goes a hundred yards and then it shadows everything behind it. You mm -hmm. can't see anything. We've gotten all of the lights the Surf, Surefire turbos, the new ones, the mm -hmm. mod lights, the mod light kind of set the tone for all this. Yeah. The clouds, Arasakas, they have this really tight focal spot mm -hmm. that now you can get two or 300 yards of illumination. And so especially from a law enforcement application, you know, shooting pigs, whatever, you can get illumination at hundreds of yards away for a good PID, low light conditions, whatever. It's like, well, they're just gonna shoot at the light. Dude, at the end of the day, I want to give myself as many options as possible. Mm -hmm. And I have absolutely started to put lights on, especially my LPBO guns. And then the only reason my SPR doesn't have one is because I only have so many lights at the moment. Yeah. Uh, my lights are expensive. Yes, they are. <laughs> but I think there absolutely, absolutely is an application. Mm -hmm. And if you have a 16, 17, 18, five Mark 12, I think having a light, would I have done that in Iraq in 2006? Like we didn't have the lights that did it. Yeah. With, if we had the lights we have now, a hundred percent. And so I think there is an application and again, it's training. And so go out. If you have a range that you can shoot low light, you can shoot at night, like throw your lights on, shoot off the tower, go see what you can see, throw up PID targets, throw up stuff that you can try to identify and use the light. And then that way, you know how to then manipulate your light off of a barricade, but it all comes down to training and seeking good training, not only from people, but just using the gear you have in ways that you may not be comfortable doing it mm -hmm. and, and figuring out ways to then accomplish that task. Yeah. Awesome. So if you're interested in any of the things you see here, we've got different optics. You can go buy any of these along with Hodge and a bunch of other great brands at Big Tech's Ordnance. There'll be a link down below. Make sure you use the coupon code. Saves you guys some money. I will also link Joe's Instagram. Go give him a follow. He does a uh, question and answer all the time. So make sure you ask him the same questions over and over again because he loves it when you guys do that. And especially ask him what his favorite barrel length is. So that's his favorite one. So, and why uh, 12... 12, 5, 6, 6 arc is the way. Yeah, it's the way. <laughs> uh, thanks, thanks for following along, guys. Make sure you hit that like and subscribe. Karate chop that bell so you get notified every time I upload a video. And I'll see you guys in the next one.